video we're going to take a look at electronegativity and how to use that to figure out the type of bonds between two atoms. So if you recall, electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. We said that electronegativity was the greatest in the top right hand corner of the periodic table excluding the noble gases. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom with a electronegativity of 4.0. We can use electronegativity values to determine the type of bonding that's present. So bond polarity describes the sharing of electrons between atoms in a covalent bond. So if you see the word covalent, that means you have a sharing. But this type of sharing is not always equal, and that gives way to bond polarity. So this is going to depend on electronegativity. So in nonpolar covalent bond, um, electrons are shared because it's covalent, and they are shared equally between the two atoms in your bond. So essentially, in order for electrons to be shared equally, both atoms have to have the exact same attraction for bonding electrons. And what is the attraction for bonding electrons called? Oh, that's electronegativity. So essentially, this is when your electronegativities of each atom are equal, or essentially the difference is zero. When will this always happen? This will always be the case when you have two of the same nonmetals. So for instance, if you have an H bonded to an H, like in your molecule of diatomic H2. Um, if you have two Cls bonded together, two Ns bonded together. This can happen in a small molecule like these diatomic elements, or this might happen in a larger molecule like two carbons bonded together in a large hydrocarbon. Okay, um, It's important to note that Though typically we're going to look at no, nonpolar bonds as between two of the same element, there are some elements that um, have almost equal electronegativities. So it could be bonded between two different nonmetals that happen to have the same electronegativity or that happen to have a very, very small difference in electronegativity. So some textbooks actually define nonpolar as not just being zero, but they give it a range of like 0.4 and less than that. Um, so you don't really need to memorize this range. Essentially, if you see two nonmetals that are the same bonded together, you know that it's going to be nonpolar. But what you should memorize is that hydrogen and carbon, um, a bond between those is always considered to be nonpolar. Even though the difference is about 0.4, so it's not exactly zero, the difference is pretty negligible. So for what you should know is, again, if you see two, like here, here, here's a C bonded to a C, that's a nonpolar bond because it's between two elements that have the exact same electronegativity. Um, you should know if you see a C bonded to an H, we also consider that to be a nonpolar bond. Otherwise, you don't have to memorize other elements that happen to have the same electronegativity, um, but if values happen to be given and you do see that two elements have the same electronegativity, then you could assume the bond to be nonpolar. Or they might ask which of the following is nonpolar and you're looking for the smallest difference that's closest to zero as possible. A polar bond is, um, since it's covalent, electrons are shared, but they are shared unequally. Essentially, one atom is going to attract electrons a little more than the other atom. So this happens when your electronegativities are not equal or the difference is greater than zero. Again, some textbooks have these exact finite um, ranges. However, they vary from source to source, so it's not really accurate. So really, anytime your difference is greater than zero, you have an increasingly polar bond. The further it is from zero, the more polar the bond is. So when will this be the case? Well, this will obviously be the case when you have two different nonmetals bonded together, like a C and an O, or an H and an F. Okay, Essentially, the electrons are going to hover closer to one atom than the other because one atom will pull a little harder on electrons than the other. The greater the difference in electronegativity, the further it is from zero, the more polar the bond. So let's take this scenario of HF. So when I'm looking at H and F, it's a nonpolar, uh, excuse me, it's a polar bond. It's two different elements with two very different electronegativities, which I can actually look up the values um, and see they're very different. Fluorine has an electronegativity of about 4. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of about 2.1, so which might vary depending on the source um, in accuracy. So 
Um, if I'm looking at this bond, um, I can indicate the polarity of it over the bond in two different ways. Um, they can give this Greek lowercase delta sign. It looks kind of like three quarters of an eight. Um, and it kind of means partial. So if I give this Greek delta and a plus over something, that means it's partially positive. And if I put this delta negative, it means slightly negative. So in the HF bond, okay, um, whichever is less electronegative is going to get the partially positive, and whichever is more electronegative is going to get the partially negative. So since fluorine is more electronegative, I can show that this is the partially negative side of the atom. Electrons are going to hover closer to this high, uh, fluorine, and it's going to give a partial negative charge to the fluorine. It's not a full negative charge. The electrons are still shared, but they are the electron density is closer to fluorine and I can give a partial positive to the hydrogen. Another way I can indicate polarity. Um, oh, and just as a note, uh, the partial par charges should cancel each other out to add up to the total charge on the molecule. So plus, minus, cancel out to be neutral. Um, or another way I can show this is just giving um, an arrow to show the shift in electron density. So I'm showing that electrons are hovering closer to the fluorine, so I would put an arrow pointing toward the fluorine. So either one of these is perfectly acceptable if they ask you to show the polarity of the bond. You will see that I typically gravitate toward the partial charges since um, when we do formal charges, we put little charges above atoms, so I just kind of feel like it goes along with that pretty nicely. Okay. Um, since there's partial charges, we can kind of see that some of these covalent compounds and these covalent bonds are going to have an ionic character to them as well. So it's really not always just cut and dry, something's ionic, something's covalent. Um, there's, there's a continuum between them. Okay. Um, we can call molecules that have one partially positive end and one partially negative end um, to be dipoles, or we say they are dipolar or they have a dipole moment. Those are all synonyms of each other to indicate that you have a molecule where you have one end positive and one end negative. And again, the greater the electronegativity difference, the greater the dipole moment. What you'll start to notice is if I have two molecules, one side is negative and the other side is positive, um, they're going to start ending up attracting each other in certain ways, um, and intermolecular forces are going to start happening. And that's what we'll see when we get to the intermolecular force chapter. Take a moment, and I want you to draw three water molecules in the box using this key, um, and show the correct orientation to each other with respect to their partial charges. So if you're doing this, okay, here's a water molecule, one oxygen for two hydrogens. Don't be that person that has it backwards and does two oxygens for one hydrogen. I drew it looking bent, and we'll see in, in terms of geometry why later. Um, so my, uh, my hydrogens are partially positive. Um, just to show that charges are are balancing out, I'm going to put two next to my partial negative charge. If you prefer to just put a partial negative by this oxygen and a partial one and just one partial positive over here, that's fine. But I want to make sure that my partial charges cancel out to zero. So if I have another hydrogen coming along, all I want to make or another water coming along, I just want to make sure that the hydrogen ends are aligning with the oxygen end so that the positives and negatives are attracting each other. Okay, so anything that kind of shows the positive hydrogen, partially positive hydrogens aligned with the partially negative oxygens. Okay, take a moment and try this example. So this is Cu2 plus. All right, if I have a water molecule, which is a polar molecule, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the oxygen will have a slight negative charge, and the hydrogens will have slight, slight positive charges, so the oxygens would be aligned toward the Cu2+. Plus. So the hydrogens should be out, and the oxygen side should be facing in. If we're looking at an ionic bond, which is typically between metals and nonmetals, metals have low electronegativity. Nonmetals have high electronegativity. Nonmetals have such a larger electronegativity than the metals that they actually steal the electron from the metal or the electrons actually transfer to the nonmetal. Again, the greater the electronegativity difference between the metal and nonmetal, um, the greater, in this case, we say the ionic character. We don't say it's more polar because it is not a covalent bond and is not polar, but we can say it has a greater ionic character.
And again, just a mention of the continuum of bonds. Um, all polar covalent bonds have some ionic character to them, as we show with those partial charges. And ionic bonds have some covalent character to them as well. So the difference is not cut and dry, it's not distinct, it's rather a continuum. Electronegativity is not the only factor. Um, and just for example, BeCl2. Okay, you would see that Be is a metal and Cl is a nonmetal, and at first glance you would probably think this is ionic, and in fact, um, this is actually covalent. Uh, Be2+, plus, if we look at it, it has a really high charge to it, okay, and it has a small radius. Um, there's only two shells to it. So um, there's a really strong Coulombic force of attraction for electrons. So any electrons that it would transfer to the Cl minuses are actually pulled back, uh, which introduces covalent character, and it kind of shares electrons rather than having it transferred to the Cl. So this is, in fact, covalent. So you can kind of explain this in terms of what we learned about periodicity last chapter. I wouldn't expect you to maybe right now just know offhand that that was covalent. Okay. So in summary, to distinguish bond type, use electronegativity difference. Nonpolar means electrons are shared equally. The difference is zero. This will typically be between two of the same nonmetal element, like two C's or two H's. Um, remember that we said CH is also considered a nonpolar bond. Polar is when electrons are shared unequally. The difference in electronegativity is greater than zero. Um, when I have two nonmetals bonded together, this will typically be two different nonmetal elements. Ionic bond is when electrons are transferred. The difference in electronegativity is greater than zero when you have a metal and nonmetal typically. Take a moment and try this example. Okay, H and O are two different nonmetals, so it's a covalent bond and it would be polar. These are two nonmetals that are the same, so this would be nonpolar. Na and F, ionic, metal, nonmetal. This is two nonmetals, they are different, so it's polar. This is a metal and a nonmetal, so I would say that's ionic. These are two of the same nonmetals joined together, so nonpolar. Here is a two nonmetals that are different, polar. For 1 through 7, which is the most polar bond, and without actually having values in front of me, I can kind of see, well, where on the periodic table are these things, and which are spread furthest from each other, um, and I would say H and O. Um, H has a relatively low electronegativity, is around 2.1, and O is the second most electronegative element. When I say which has the greatest ionic character, now I can start to consider my ionic compounds too. I don't want to pick something ionic for most polar because I'm looking for something covalent by the word polar. Um, so I would choose Na and F, which would have the largest difference, just kind of seeing where they're located on the periodic table and the difference between them. Uh, which has electrons transferred, that's the definition of ionic. Which has electrons shared equally, that's the definition of nonpolar covalent. And which have electrons shared unequally, that's the definition of polar covalent. Take a moment, and here, now I'm giving you electronegativity values. Which of the following is most polar? So if I'm doing this, I want to actually calculate the difference for each of these. If I'm calculating the difference, I essentially want the absolute value of the difference. So it doesn't matter in my bond which is first and which is second. You're just kind of always subtracting the higher number minus the lower number, or just taking the absolute value of the difference. So here I'm always showing it with the higher number minus the lower number, and I notice that here are my electronegativity differences. The most polar would be the greatest difference. The least polar would be the lowest difference. Take another moment to try this example. Out of all of these, E is really the only one that has a metal and nonmetal, so automatically I would say that this is the most ionic. Take a moment and try this example. Notice I don't have electronegativity values in front of me, but they are all bonded to the same element H, so I can see essentially which one of these elements is most electronegative using my trend, and I would say oxygen. It's helpful to know that fluorine is the most electronegative and oxygen is the second most electronegative element as well. Okay. Um, question, which kinds of bonds are within polyatomic ions, such as nitrate? So within nitrate, the N is covalently bonded to the O. It's two non, uh, 
so I should say N and O. Um, it's two nonmetals, and they are two different nonmetals with different electronegativities. So these would be covalent bonds between the N and the O. It just happens to have a charge to it because there's one more electron within this molecule that's shared within this molecule, um, and that would allow it to also ionically bond. So if I have an ionic compound, like in this next question, that contains a polyatomic ion, there will be two types of bonds here. There would be uh, covalent bonds between the N and the O in nitrate. And there would be ionic bonds between the calcium 2 plus and the nitrite ions forming an ionic compound. So if you see a polyatomic ion within an ionic compound, that molecule, or that compound I should say, contains both ionic and covalent bonds.